Why did so many pirates wear an eye patch? Hmm, that's a good question. Were they all really one-eyed? I don't think so. And <laughs> how do they get horses to the Olympics? <laughs> he snorted say, like a horse. Say <laughs> what? Answers to those and other questions coming up in this episode of The Off-Ramp with Bob and Marsha Smith. Welcome to the off-ramp, a chance to slow down, steer clear of crazy, take a side road to sanity, get some perspective on life, and answer some of life's weirdest questions, <laughs> including yours, Marcia, about yeah. the pirates. Okay, why do they wear eye patches, Bob? Well, because it looks good in the movies. <laughs> yeah, and on the ride at Disney World. Okay, why did Pi... Well, maybe maybe it was about those hooks gouged out the eyes when they got into fights. Is so that you, it? So you're thinking a lot of them just had one eye. Well, this is fascinating, Bob. They did it to see better in the dark. What? According to the Children's Museum of Indianapolis, the eye patch could be used to prepare one eye to see in the dark. So when they would go, pirates would go below deck, they would swap the eye patch from one eye to the other and see with the eye that is already adjusted to the low light condition. Oh, because there, there's no. no windows down below. That's right. Okay. That would allow them to instantly see in the dark. Wow. Where did this come from? Where's the source of that? Well, uh, it's part of the history at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis, but it's in several other references. I think I saw it on, uh, what's that place you like? Mental Floss? Yeah. Okay. That too. That is fascinating. Yeah. It helps them adjust immediately to low light conditions so they don't uh, fumble around down below. And we should say that in the past tense, it helped them adjust to the dark conditions below. Not it helps them, because I don't think there are pirates today who wear eye patches, eye patches well, other than Johnny Depp in the movies. I was going to say Johnny Depp does, <laughs> but okay. All right, Marcia, I've got that interesting little story I'll get to in a minute about how they get horses to the Tokyo Olympics. <laughs> I'd be curious, yeah. Because I was watching the horses, and I thought, well, now these couldn't just be random horses. They had to... What's the event? Equestrian? Yeah, they have equestrian. several equestrian events. We'll get to that in a minute. But okay. first, I have a question closer to home here. How did a bad experience at a drugstore lead to one of the major new brands for men's personal care? <laughs> How, say I, that. I'll say it's for shaving, okay? Okay. How did a bad experience at a drugstore lead to one of the major new brands in shaving? The only thing that pops into my mind are those those new razors that are out there. Harry's? Harry. Okay, yeah. Harry, yeah, because uh, he went in and those good razor blades were so dang expensive he thought, uh, I can do better than this, and he went to Germany. You must have read the same article I read. Well, I read the box that you brought home. Oh, <laughs> oh that's the reason. Well, I went a little deeper than that, Marsh. Okay, okay. You know, we always like to look at axioms for entrepreneurs or axiom for yeah, business. right. This one I would say is, don't make it hard for your customers to get to your product. Oh. Because what happened was, and this was back in 2011, Andy Katz Mayfield, he was in his local drugstore trying to buy razor blades, and he had that same experience many of us have. He was frustrated because it was in one of those locked up cases. Oh. And he couldn't find anybody to open it up. And on top of that, they were so darn expensive. Yeah. I'm talking about the G brand, which we all know, the one that made shaving I... famous because it was give away the razor, sell the yeah. blades. That's Gillette, yeah. right? So he said, I couldn't get to him. On top of that, they were expensive. So what he did was he was ticked. He called his friend Jeff Rader to complain. Well, guess what? They both have MBAs, and they immediately saw a business opportunity. Absolutely. And so Harry's was born. That's one of the first consumer brands that was sold online only. But uh, quickly, it got store distribution. Today, you can find their products you yes. know, next to Gillette's yeah. and it all the Barbasol. It's only and... been about a year or so that I'm seeing them in big stores now. Yeah, and who who would have thought it didn't look like a fair fight? Who could compete with precision machined razor blades with five blades produced in highly automated manufacturing plants? Well, anyway, Katz Mayfield has an MBA from Stanford, and Raider, his friend, had an MBA from Wharton. He helped co-found the uh, Warby Parker eyewear brand that's big on the web. I think our kids both have bought their eyeglasses from oh, okay. Warby Parker. 
So they put together a business plan that included buying a 500-employee razor blade factory in Germany that had been grinding precision steel for more than 100 years, and Harry's was born. Harry's is a play on what do you get if you don't you get, shave. You, you get, get Harry. Harry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so and again, the lesson there is don't make things difficult for your customers. They may just compete against you. <laughs> okay, Bobby, you ready? Yes. What's the best-selling cookie in the world? The best-selling cookie in the world, I would say it's Oreo. Why would you say that? Because I love them. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you're so weak. And there are multiple parts. You know, we have to assemble it. It's not just a regular cookie. That's right. It's got things to do. Is it an Oreo? It is. Wow. You win. I was, uh, I had a feeling you'd get that. According to a 2014 study, the sandwich cookie brand from Nabisco generated global sales that year of $3.28 billion. Wow. The cookie has been able to move across the generations and cultures and easily outperform the competition around the world for every kind of cookie. And it's a real testimony to science and putting science in manufacturing because now they have multiple thicknesses of the layer, cream in the middle, Uh multiple flavors in the middle. Yeah. Ah, everything but the shape has changed. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay, I have a couple of fun music questions, then we'll get to my horse questions. Who were the first artists named to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and when was that? Oh, jeez, oh, jeez, oh, jeez. The first woman was Aretha Franklin. That's right. But that's not one of the first people. No. The first artists. What year do you think it was? Let's start with that. Oh, gosh. 65. 86, Marcia. Okay. 86. Can you give me just three of the artists that made the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on the first year? On the first year. Elvis Presley. One. Uh, Johnny B. Good, Chuck Berry. Two. Uh, Buddy Holly. Three. You got uh, three of them. Oh, That's wow. good. The first year, I remember they named off all these people. They include they were Chuck Berry, James Brown, Ray Charles, Sam Cooke, Fats Domino, the Everly Brothers, Buddy Holly, Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard, and Elvis Presley. That was the class of 1986. Yeah. I remember at the time thinking, well, who's, who's left? left, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, it turns out a whole lot. <laughs> a whole lot of people. Yeah. But that was the class of 86, and the Hall of Fame was, wasn't actually a building at that time. It was in New York City. And then they moved to Cleveland in 1995. Okay, and you answer my second question. Who was the first woman inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? What year was that? For God's sakes, how would I know? Um, I'll just say, what do, what, 86 was the when it opened? Mm-hmm. I'll say 2002. No, luckily it was 1987, so it was the next year Aretha Franklin went in. Well, good. They didn't wait forever. Yeah, it wasn't like they ignored women for years and years. Just they ignored them the first year. (laughs) Tina Turner must have got in pretty quick after that. We will have that answer in the future at some point, I'm sure. (laughs) Okay, ready? All right. You probably were very curious about this question. How many eyelids do do camels have? How many eyelids do mm-hmm. camels have? Yes. Wow, I never thought about camels. Having more than one eyelid. Even having one, I never thought about yeah. it. But of course they well, have one. I bet they have several because they have to deal with sand, so they probably evolved correct. to have three eyelids. Very good, Bob. Good deduction and correct. Oh, wow. I thought yeah. you were going to say and incorrect. Yeah. <laughs> they have three sets of eyelids on each eye and two rows of eyelashes. Two uh, rows of eyelashes. Uh-huh, on top of that. They all help keep that pesky sand out of their eyes. The long eyelashes act like dusters. You ever see those close up? Or even on puppets, they always have these really yes. long eyelashes. Comics and yeah. uh, things, right. They keep the sand moving out of their eyes. So that is not a big exaggeration when they do that as yeah, the Yeah, uh, I always caricature. thought it was. I just thought it was to make it cute. But no, they really do have. And their third eyelid is a transparent thin membrane that works as a shield to protect the camel's eye from dust and sand while still retaining moisture. So it's a... It's a a lubricant as well as a protector. Yeah, it's it's a a thin shield. It's like a membrane, so it keeps it moist in there. How about that? Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So we go from camels to another beast of burden, but these are called equine athletes. So my question is, how do they get horses to the Olympics? They either fly them or they go across on the ocean. Neither one, I would think, was a spectacular idea. I'll just say uh, fly. Fly, you're right. We're talking horses, and in this case, I'm talking about the Tokyo Olympics. That's when I really thought, wow, horses, 
these can't be just any horses because people train with the horses for years. So how did they get them to Japan? Yeah. Obviously, they have to be flown. So owners take their horses their, their own horses and their riders and they ship them by plane. But it's I got some interesting information on this. They load the horses into pre-built stalls, two horses per stall, which sounds crowded, yeah. but actually they're designed to hold three horses, so they actually have more room, so they're business class. <laughs> Do they sleep standing up? They sleep standing up. Oh, yeah. no problem. Okay. So anyway, um, they, they also fly with a support staff, every horse, of veterinarians and groomers who, among other things, try to make sure the horses stay relaxed. It's the human equivalent of business class. The stallions travel at the front of the plane so as not to be distracted really? by the mayors. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> they don't want to distract the stallions. Oh. Now, NPR had a great article here from the 2012 Olympics, and FedEx flew 60 horses to England that year for the Olympics from all parts of the world. Well, now there's something I would have never thought to FedEx. Wonder what the rate on that is. Well, I actually have that. <laughs> How much it costs? Yeah, yeah, but but the cost, uh, it depends on the weight, the distance, and the airport availability. So a lot of it's the same as uh, any kind of FedEx thing. It's up to $55,000, including the round-trip airfare. So that is a lot. And each one of these horses weighs 1,100 pounds at least. So that's why it costs so much. And horses need passports. They have passports. Wow. And they are microchipped, unlike human athletes. Yeah. They're microchipped. You're not one of these people who really likes flying that much. Oh, are you? I hate flying. Yeah. Well, guess what? What? A lot of the horses do too. Yeah. He said, even though they're superstars, some horses don't like to travel. They're worriers. They worry about the noise and the sound and the pressure. They remain standing. Every once in a while, they turn off that fasten your ropes button so that they, <laughs> <laughs> so the horses can roam around, you know, a little bit. And um, the in-flight beverage and snack service for horses, what do you think that would be? Well, I would imagine um, uh, some sugar cubes. And uh, some water. Hay mixed with apple juice, mixed with water. Okay. They also get Gatorade, so oh. that keeps them hydrated. And, of course, carrots. Oh. We can't forget carrots. No wine to calm them down? <laughs> they might be given a mild sedative, which I is would, uh, equivalent to a glass of champagne or two. I'm, I'm sure they do. <laughs> so I mean, that's how you get horses to the Olympics. <laughs> do you ever wonder how much cheese cheese heads eat, Bob? Stats show that annually we consume the most in the United States, 32.7 pounds a year. In Wisconsin? Yes. Okay. Yes, although uh, this, uh, right behind us is California and Idaho. When they're not eating potatoes, they're eating cheese. Anyway, <laughs> but we are, we are pikers compared to one country who comes in almost double us at 62 pounds a year per person, for cheese. Okay, I will suggest it is because a lot of the Wisconsin farmers who came here and started doing dairy were from Germany. I'll say Germans. Well, that's a good guess. No. Where are they? Denmark. No kidding. Yeah. Followed closely by Iceland, Finland, and fourth place, my first guess, France. Hmm, okay. And the Danes like to top their cheese with jam or chocolate, and they do it a lot and regularly. And now, statistically, they are the tallest people in the world. Who? The Dutch. Really? Yeah. From Holland, yeah. from the Netherlands. Yeah. The tallest people in the yeah. world. And yeah. they're cheese eaters. And milk drinkers. Well, that's what mom always said. That's right. Get strong bones. Strong uh, bones and make you grow tall. That, who knew mom was right? <laughs> <laughs> so nice to know mom was right after all. <laughs> we'll be back with more in just a moment. You're listening to The Off-Ramp with Bob. And Marsha. Smith. We're back with more on The Off-Ramp with Bob and Marcia Smith trivia today. And Marcia, I have some more women rock and roll trivia questions. Yeah. I, we had the one which you actually pre-guessed. I call it a pre-guess. <laughs> <laughs> that was Aretha Franklin. I am omniscient. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so how many women have been inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame more than once? You know, where they were members yeah, of yeah, bands yeah, and then yeah, they were yeah, also yeah. inducted. I'll say nine. Nine. No, just three. Okay. And one was not in a band. This was a songwriter. Oh, Carol King? Carol King, yes. She was inducted first with her writing partner, Jerry Goffin, in 1990, and then for her solo career yeah. later. Stevie Nicks entered as part of the Fleetwood Mac Band in 1998, and then for her solo work, 2019. And then the woman you mentioned earlier, 
Tina Turner. Tina Turner, yes. She was part of Ike and Tina Turner in 1991. And she got in solo, too. And she got in for her solo career later, too. Oh, that's very cool. You know, one of my favorite shows, live shows, was Beautiful. Remember that? We mm-hmm. saw that together. That was It was a stage show about Carol King's life, her right? Whole Musical. Life. It was wonderful. Okay, Bob. What mammal sleeps the least amount of hours? I would say it's human beings. No. Oh, okay. Uh mammals. I think of possums. No. I think of dogs. No. Okay, what is it, Marsh? I wouldn't have guessed this. Elephants. Really? They only sleep in the wild two hours a day. Holy cow. Yeah. And captive ones, I don't know, probably because they're depressed, generally sleep three to seven hours a day on average. But Seven hours, that's a long up time. Up to then. seven, yeah, for an elephant who's, yeah. But in the wild, they all sleep, uh, apparently, two hours is the perfect norm. Isn't that amazing? As huge an animal as yeah. that is, you'd yeah. think they'd need more sleep yeah. than two hours a day. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right, um, I've got one more Rock and Roll Hall of Fame question, and then I'll drop this category for a show or two, okay? Thank you, Bob. Okay, who is the only artist inducted three times in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Three times. Oh, for different categories like music uh, and I'll, singing and I'll give you some hints here, okay? Yeah. okay there are, is it a he? Yes. He's a guitarist. He's British. He's been active since the mid-60s, and he still performs today. Paul McCartney. No. Eric Clapton. Eric Clapton, that's right. He came in with the Yardbirds in 1992, yeah, yeah. and then a member of Cream in 93, and then his solo career in 2000. So okay. there you go. Well, here's something you're going to say. Say, what? Your nose is the exact same size as your what? <laughs> <laughs> okay, do I just avoid this question? No, no. <laughs> Your nose is yeah, exact it, same it, size as your thumb. That's right. Is it? Yes. I just put my thumb in front of me when I said that, and I thought, well, it's kind of about the it same is. size. It is. Put it up there. It is the same size from the joint to the top. Oh, so it's the same length, apparently. Yeah. But they're well, a little wider than thumbs. Yeah, the same length. Huh. Yeah. So that's not all. The length of your forearm, uh, measured from the crook of your elbow to your wrist, is also the exact same size as your what? As your... Look at your forearm now, saying from the crook. I would say it's from your hips down to your knees. It's the same. Like your thigh? Yeah. Uh-huh. Thigh? No. Your foot. What? Yeah, your foot. Your foot is the same size from your from your wrist to the crook in your arm. I'll, I'll measure you after the my show. My foot is that big? It looks that, bigger than my foot. That's what I said. That's ridiculous. But I got out the old tape measure, and there it was, nine okay. and a half. Huh. So. Well, that's probably part of the geometric balance you need it in order is. to stay It is. It is a very right? Da Vinci-like perfection. And this is in all human beings, unless you're, you know, particularly out of sorts. But <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's Everybody's like that. That huh? is fascinating. All right. So this is from the more things change, the more they remain the same. This was an item I saw um, on mental floss. Okay. Mm-hmm. See if this sounds familiar. I think if you're a person of a certain age, it might For those wanting to build a vinyl record collection, Mm -hmm. Amazon has introduced a new subscription service. Oh, no, not like Columbia. (laughs) It sounds just like it. Oh, my God, which broke me. According to Elaine Selna, writing on Mental Floss, with this service, you'll receive a classic record through the mail every month all of which are handpicked by the curators at Amazon Music. Currently, the club focuses on the golden era of vinyl, which the company categorizes as the 60s and the 70s. So the records so far include hits like The Wall by Pink Floyd and uh, London Calling by The Clash. The subscription service is only available in the United States, comes with free shipping. You can look ahead and see which album is on its way that month. If you aren't interested in what's in store, you can simply check, skip this box, or return it for free. Exactly the same. So if you're a person of a certain age, that certainly sounds like the old Columbia Record Club. I was a member, were you? Oh, yeah. Because, you know, I grew up in a small town, unlike you, so there weren't that many great record stores. Yeah, I'm sure. this was fantastic. You get a new album every month? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And sometimes they had specials where you'd buy buy them for, I forget what albums cost back then. They were only 
selling like three or four dollars an album, but you'd get an album for a dollar seventy five. Th- that's you know? probably why you and I had so many Huge LPs record collections. when we got married. Then. Right. Good that's... God, look at this! But that's one way Marcia and I knew we would like each other. We had, oh, you've got these. I've got this record too. Oh, I've got their <laughs> stuff too. Yeah, it was kind of fun to go into each other's apartment and see the same albums there, like the same books. You know. Yes. All anyway, right. so that's a new subscription service. It all comes around, baby. It yeah. all comes around. Okay. How long, Bob, does it take for us humans to grow an entire new skeleton? To grow a new skeleton, because we actually are doing that in our lifetime? Is that the truth? Is that yeah. what this... Really? Well, well, I never I, thought of that. I, did, I didn't either. I thought you had these bones and they and were they old were there. bones? Yeah. No. The truth is, the humans grow a new skeleton every 12 years. Wow. Due to the body's continual replacement of its bone cells. I never thought of that. I didn't either. So every 12 years, you got a whole different body going on. I just there. hope I have another 12 years <laughs> left. <laughs> well, it just, you know, suppose you had a replacement of a hip or a knee. What happens in 12 years? Everything just regenerates. You know, you shed bad cells. It goes into your bloodstream and goes know. away. You know, okay. a lot of stuff goes through waste, and a lot of it's, you know, cells that yeah. die and go away. Okay. It's an amazing thing, the human body. Do you know how fast bunnies run, Bob? How fast they run? Yeah. No. You give me what? Give me your best guess. Well, miles let's see. per hour. Thirty miles an hour is really fast, and I doubt if they could run that fast because they're tiny little feet. Usain Bolt. Is that how you say his first name? Usain Bolt. You okay. Know, yeah. The Olympic. He ran twenty-seven miles per hour. So I'm just giving you a bunny and a bolt. Well, are they comparison. the same? Are no. They- not close? No. Both bunnies run less fast? They run fast. No kidding. Yeah. Even though they're tiny little legs, yes. how fast do yeah. they run? Up to 45 miles per hour. Holy cow. No I wonder w- why they run out in front of cars. I, I can would, make this. <laughs> I wouldn't have guessed that in a million years. 45 miles yeah. an hour. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, Marsha, I have some interesting questions for you about a TV show that you and I used to watch, okay? Mm -hmm. 24. Remember that? Of course. We watched that. We loved it. One of the first epic series of the 2000s, right? It was a imminent threats, last minute saves, all done to the soundtrack of a beeping clock. Remember that? Mm -hmm. It went on for eight real-time years, but they covered 11 years in digital time. Can you believe it premiered 20 years ago? In 2001. Oh, my gosh. That's really? how long ago it was. Kiefer Sullivan. Kiefer, Kiefer Sullivan, yeah. Kiefer Sullivan was the star. Okay. Scott Beggs published a great article on that in Mental Floss. First, we know it was a violent show. You and I used to joke about Jack. You know, don't yeah. let him near an electrical cord. Or He's going <laughs> to he strangle finds, somebody. He'd you find know? something awful to do with it. So here's my first question, Marcia. Yeah. On the TV series 24, one of our old all-time favorites, how many people did Jack Bauer kill? Oh, my God. <laughs> How long was it on the air? Eight years. Oh, my. Trying to think. At least 10 per show, 160. <laughs> I'll say 1,500. Oh, no, not that many people. No, he didn't kill that many people. 270 people over eight seasons. So that's 18 years in universe or 15 people a year, which makes our hero much more prolific than the average serial killer. <laughs> 270 people. So 15 people a year he would kill. And guess what? 24 was not originally about the war on terror. What was it going to be about? It was a countdown show. The Russians? No. The Chinese? No. (laughs) You won't believe this. What? It was going to be about a wedding. (laughs) (laughs) The concept of the show is about the day leading up to a wedding. So the clock was going to be ticking off as the wedding got closer. Apparently, for some reason, that was quickly scrapped in favor of a thriller where someone's daughter was kidnapped, and eventually it morphed into the anti-terrorist drama. Now... This is what really blows my mind. Most of the first season was filmed before 911. It was not a reaction to 911. We all kind of thought, hey, this is. Well, there were hijackings and things by then. Yeah, terrorists are going to attack. That was all thought through before 911. Interesting. And the ticking clock was a pain for the writers. You want the character of Curtis to be at the CTU, but he's at the airport. How that, do we get him where he needs to be? Did, yeah, and they never went to the bathroom in those 24 that's right, hours. That's right. That's ever. one thing we always said. He would, Jack never went to the bathroom. Just give me. Or eat. Or he any of never, the people, right? He wouldn't eat, drink, or go to the bathroom. He just was. Two more things. The clock appeared silent. When did that happen? Commercial. No. <laughs> it's when a major character died. It would still keep ticking, but the, the sound effect would go away. Really? Yeah. Okay, now they went through all these years. How many presidents were there? Three. When, 11 presidents. No. Yes. No. There were 11 presidents, and only one served a full term. Dennis Haysbert, the black president, 
President Palmer, who today is all the Allstate commercials. Yes. He was the only president elected to office to finish a full term. One president was incapacitated during attack on Air Force One. Another was unseated when his terrorist activities were exposed. One was assassinated and one resigned because of her involvement in the assassination cover-up. Oh, and then one left because of dementia, which (laughs) which all all of us almost uh, suffered by the time the show ended. We're familiar with that scenario. (laughs) Okay. All right. I'm going to finish up my questions with some pop questions. Okay. Music questions. Just fill in the name. The Queen of Soul is? Aretha Franklin. Queen of Blues? Uh, Billie Holiday. Diana Washington. Ah, Diana Washington. The Queen of Disco? Well, that was Donna Summer. King of Swing? Benny Goodman. King of Cowboys? Roy Rogers. Good. And the King? Oh, Elvis Presley. That's right. You got five out of six. Good going, Bob. Well, that's good. That was very That's good. A, what's that called? Music royalty? Uh-huh. Is that the category uh-huh. there? Uh-huh. <laughs> do you have a quote? Oh, yeah, I do. Do you remember Colonel Oliver North? Oliver North was during the... Um, Iran-Contra affair. That's exactly right, yeah. during the Reagan years. Yes, and this is a quote from, <laughs> from Oliver. I was provided with additional input that was radically different from the truth. I assisted in furthering that version Oh, really? <laughs> Instead of saying I lied. I helped to spread a lie. No. That's, that's his convoluted way, which we've now become accustomed to. But back in the old days, you say, what the hell did he just say? Wouldn't you love to have your kid tell you that when you say, who stole this apple? Yeah. What would the kid say? I was provided with additional input that was radically different from the truth. <laughs> I assisted in furthering that version, Mom. That's right. You <laughs> stole the apple, and you helped Billy steal the apple. Oh, and, my God. Oh, that's funny. That, uh, oh, that just Well, that just shows you mind. lawyers can be creative. Yeah. <laughs> All right. (laughs) All right. That's it for this time. We hope you've enjoyed our trivia for this day. I'm Bob Smith. I'm Marcia Smith. Join us again next time when we return with more trivia on The The Off-Ramp. The Off-Ramp is produced in association with CPL Radio Online and the Cedarbrook Public Library, Cedarbrook, Wisconsin.